Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Billy McDermott. I'm the Customer Success Director here at Candida ID. It is 4 p.m. Um, in Glasgow. We've got a lovely, cloudy, kind of sunny, kind of rainy Glasgow, as you can see um, out my window behind me. Pretty much a typical June. Thank you very much to everyone who's managed to dial in for today's session. It's the next Candida ID Talent Pipe, uh, Talent Pipe webinar, How to Avoid Getting Trashed by Candidates. I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by my good friend, Mark Horning. Mark, thank you so much for joining us. It's, uh, it's bright and early where you are today, isn't it? It's, it's, it's early, but uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area, we're suffering what we call the June gloom. So we get um, a, a nice overcast. It makes it very pleasant, actually. So I uh, can't complain about the weather here. Absolutely wonderful. Um, for for those who don't know me, um, I um, I lead all the client delivery work here at Canada ID and, and also our product development team. Um, so I'm really hands on with the work that we do, and hopefully be able to share some some really good insight with you over the next 45 minutes or so. Please do use the question um, section, um, either the questions or the chat section um, on Crowdcast to say hello. There will be a recording um, available afterwards as well. That will all get sent out. We're also live on Facebook at the moment, so please jump on and share if you can find the stream. Mark, would you like to tell everyone a little bit about yourself? So um, I'm, again, Mark Hornung. I am an employer brand and recruitment and marketing uh, advocate and consultant. Um, work out of the San Francisco Bay Area. I've been working in the field for mm, since dinosaurs roamed the earth. Uh, and. Uh, uh, have worked both as a consultant and as a practitioner in HR departments at uh, big data and analytics firms, Informatica and Teradata. Um, and, uh, you know, I am excited about the topic. And as you'll see during today's conversation, I get pretty passionate about it, too. That that's what we like to see. So there was a previous session that you that you ran with, with um, our chief chief revenue officer um, Scott. Um, I think it was a couple of weeks ago. I was um, on my travels. Um, I was away. Um, do you want to just in in thirty seconds or a minute just let the audience know what we spoke about then and how it, how it ties into what we're going to talk about today? Well, I think the the key takeaways from the last session were the fact that um, you know first of all, employer brands are relationships relationships between the employer and uh, candidates, as well as employees and former employees. And that uh, in today's world, uh, the stronger you can make those relationships, the more successful you're going to be in attracting and hiring the kinds of people who are gonna make your organization successful. And I think the other key point that we made in that is, you know, there was a time when recruiting, and this is Scott's analogy, was really like net fishing. You just throw it out there, see what you caught, and throw away the ones you didn't want. Today, thanks to tools such as Candidate ID, you can actually do spear phishing. You can identify the individuals that you really want to build that relationship with and go about doing that using various tools so that that person is predisposed to talk to you about the opportunities you may have and is really excited about the chance to become a part of an organization they've come to know through those various channels. Fantastic. Let's let's start to take that that conversation um, further. Then Let, let's talk about the importance of um, consumer brand advocates um, and how that was similar um, to you know what what you're talking about in terms of recruitment brand advocates. We had a discussion a couple of days ago. Um, mm -hmm. about this and, and I gave some examples of how there are organizations there are um, businesses that, that I'm a customer a loyal very loyal customer of um, companies like Spotify um, mm -hmm. uh, companies like Moleskin um, companies like Converse who, because I'm a consumer advocate of, of those companies and no offense to uh, to Adam um, and, and the rest of the team but if Converse or Spotify called me tomorrow um, for a job then um, sorry I'd probably go and work from them <laughs> you know and that that's not because you know that, that, that I, it's not because I'm particularly um, in love with their employer brand but it's because I love the products or I love the right. service um, right. that, that they offer um, uh, as well so do you know the for my, my view very much is when we're, we're starting to engage with candidates is about how do you build up a, um, a relationship with a person okay a person first and make them make them a brand advocate um, 
uh, and then and then and then carry that through. Um, and actually, you come up with a really interesting analogy yesterday talking about sports teams. Um, do you want to yes. talk about that a little bit? Because I, I think yeah. this is a really, really good example of why that's important. So when we talk about brands, and, and again, I define a brand as a relationship between an organization and its stakeholders, whether it's customers, investment analysts, uh, regulators, or in our case, employees. And uh, when you think about building a relationship, uh, in your life, you have varying levels or degrees of relationship. You have the very intimate relationships with your partner or your spouse or your family. Then you have close but not as close relationships with, say, your coworkers or your friends. Uh, and it, it spokes outward like that. And uh, one that I like to use uh, is the fact that sports teams are brands. And so you see the as uh, the Philadelphia Phillies here in the United States, it's a baseball team. Their mascot is the fanatic uh, because their fans are fanatical about their team. And, um, you know, it bears no or very tenuous relationship with the team's performance. So, for example, again, in the United States, um, we have a team like the Chicago Cubs baseball team that for years was known as a loser. Uh, you know, it never won the World Series. It never won the National League Championship. And the crap, the stands would be packed for every game. And it was almost like a ritual in the Midwest that families from Illinois and Indiana and the states near Chicago would come on a pilgrimage to Wrigley Field. And you're like, why are they rooting for a team that's a loser? Well, the team had developed this relationship. And there's it's very you know, deep and rich in terms of rituals and location and even the food they serve in the stands. But it's created this bond that regardless of whether the Cubs win or lose, and recently they did win the World Series, but regardless of their performance, people are enamored of them. And I think the same can be true for employer brands. Um, one that I like to, see, to cite is um, here in the United States, the U.S. Marine Corps have a very strong brand. And um, you know when you talk to Marines or you go on a Marine base, it's very interesting to listen how they talk. And they will say things like, please don't step on my parade deck, my Marine Corps, they own it. Now, of course, the Marines have certain disciplinary tactics that they can use that most employers can't, but um, <laughs> it, it really is true. And I have personal experience. My son and my brother were both Marines. Um, right. the, the attachment that they develop and the pride is intense and it lasts a lifetime. And that should be sort of the, the bar that we shoot for. Not everybody can attain it, of course, but that's what you're looking at. Um, and so, you know, and to your point, we can look at uh, consumer brands as sort of a, a guide or a roadmap, if you will, on how to build that uh, intensity and that uh, everlasting nature of the relationship. And and once you've got that ever everlasting relationship, that's that ties us into what you know the the, the subject line of this webinar. Um, the, the deeper the relationship, the, the unbreakable bond that exists between, as you say, the, the, the stakeholder and the, the, the organization, it means that it, that's really, really, really difficult for that stakeholder to then criticize that organization in, in any way. It takes something really difficult, like really damaging, um, really disruptive um, for, right. for them. For, right. for them to criticize it uh, we see it in politics actually um mm -hmm. in, in the uk you know we, we see it you know that that's massive you 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 sometimes switch you know allegiances and political parties but generally the, there's a there's a loyalty and it, and it you know it takes a significant event you know for for those loyalties to to, to actually actually switch and that for me is how then how you know how can you know how do you avoid getting trashed by candidates? Well, the dream fix, you know, is you de develop a deeper relationship with your candidates um, that they have with the brands that, that they love or the, the organizations that they love at a at a consumer at a consumer level. Right. And and I think that 
uh, and we and Scott and I talked about this in the last session is a lot of employers are literally wasting an asset that they have in the communities and the databases that are in their applicant tracking systems uh, because they've they've made the investment to get those people to raise their hand and say yes I want to be a part of your organization you have the contact information you have their records and then in 90% of the cases you do nothing with them and so it's almost like you know and again to use another popular analogy of dating and all that you're at a dance and you go up and you say to someone hey would you like to dance and they ignore you um you know what's what's that relationship going to turn out to be uh so and of course not everyone who applies is someone who's going to be a good fit for your organization we know that but the the challenge is identifying the people who will be a good fit and there are ways you can do that now through the use of technology and then cultivating that relationship by delivering content to them that they will find interesting and that will enhance their impression of you and so when the time comes that an opportunity does come up that they would be a good fit for and you reach out to them they're primed and ready to go uh, and to your earlier point if Porsche called me tomorrow, I would crawl to work for them. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it, 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 and, and that's actually, that's the um, inherent advantage that consumer brands have when it comes to building an employer brand. Uh, you know, they don't have to spend a lot of time and effort explaining who they are and what they do. Everybody knows who they are. Um, but when, you know, in my most recent past experience with Teradata, it's a company that's been around for 40 years and not 20% of the market uh, can recall their name when asked. So, you know, there's an awareness problem that B2B companies like that have to overcome. But it's worth the effort because as we've discussed, once people have developed that affinity, have become fans, if you will, then it's going to be that much easier to get them to become employees later on and that's what it's all about. Just before I move on to the next point, guys, remember that there's lots of you um, on the session this afternoon. Um, thanks for dialing in. Um, please do questions, talk um, yourself um, on, on the sidebar. If there's anything that you um, disagree with, um, anything that you do agree with, or actually if you've got any examples of really good consumer brands that you think have managed to turn that um, into into employer brands, then you know let, let us know, and um, we, we'd love to we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to talk about examples. The next thing I'm going to talk about then is how okay, if we're not in a situation where we've got the advantage of Spotify or the advantage of Porsche um, or or anyone like that, how how do you try and actually turn um, you know turn your brand, your consumer brand, into an employer brand? Um, and we're going to talk through talk through some examples here. Now, the first one I'm going to talk about is a brilliant example that I wasn't aware of um, until Mark <laughs> raised it with me because we we in the UK so we've got a different relationship with 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 marijuana, um, but California a little bit more liberal um, is is legalised marijuana. So so it's a, a better example. Mark, do you want to talk to me about about weed maps? Um, tell me a bit about them and, and about why you you highlighted weed maps to me as a as a great example of, of a brand who have managed to avoid getting trashed by candidates um, despite the fact they could potentially be a controversial brand well they, yes and and I think one of the things you have to acknowledge about weed maps is they understand and appreciate that it's easy to dismiss them um, and uh, I was talking to them a couple of weeks ago and I said you know your problem probably is people think you're a bunch of stoners making a product for other stoners and they said exactly that that is the issue and the reality is is this is a company and f to clarify what they do is they provide uh it's almost like a yelp for people who want to buy cannabis in california and other states where it's legal and so it, it tells you where it's available what they're selling what the prices are reviews by uh customers um and also, uh, they're an advocate for the legalization of cannabis throughout the United States, um, and they take it very seriously. And they, and you know, that's a whole other issue. They do a very sophisticated effort at lobbying state and federal governments to uh, change the laws and and make it legal for for people to use. But um, from an employment standpoint, um, they are 
obviously using the web to sell their uh, you know uh, customers' products and to do their advocacy. And uh, as they pointed out, most of their users are on the mobile platform. So the challenges for them technically are how do you build web apps at scale for a mobile environment? That's a very difficult challenge and it requires some very sophisticated technologies. And so what WeMaps have done is they host periodic meetups with technical groups in Southern California, which is where they're based. They're based in Orange County, California. And uh, they will uh, have their uh, chief technical officer and their engineers go to these groups and describe some of the technical challenges that they're facing and lay out how they're addressing those challenges. And of course, it's very effective from a recruiting standpoint um, that you know they're able to uh, show these people, hey, we're working in very uh, advanced uh, technologies. We're using languages like Elixir and Ruby on Rails and things like that. And here's how we're applying them. And all of a sudden you realize, oh, this is a very advanced company from a technical standpoint. Um, the end product, the result may be controversial and they'll be the first to tell you, you don't have to indulge in cannabis to, to work here. Um, and it's not like they sit around vaping all day. Um, it's a serious business and it works very hard at uh, delivering to their customers the product that they expect. And in order to do that, they have to use advanced technology. But the thing I really am impressed with is how they've gone about reaching out to the groups and it's a very soft sell it's not we're having a career event it's let us tell you how we're using elixir and you can share your ideas and you know they're betting and i think it's a good bet that the people who attend those events are going to go wow these guys are really you know interesting they're doing some great work i want to be a part of that the thing that really impressed me um, about the example is like you say it's about how they go um, how they, they, they've recognised this as the method <clears throat> of getting over the fact that they are a potentially controversial product with, and, and that people will make assumptions. Um, right. Like you say, you know, the, 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 stoner, the, the, the stoner analogy or the fact that everyone, you know, you, you may assume if you're not involved in that community or in that organisation that, you know, everyone everyone um, smokes marijuana. Um, uh, that, that's a, and that's a, anyone outside of that, I, I certainly, because, because from the UK, that would be the assumption that I that, that I make and I'm mm -hmm. I, I'm pretty liberal you know I'm pretty pretty, pretty open-minded so, so the way and and this is just one example but it's a good example of an extreme brand you know it's not a run-of-the-mill brand it's not a big big tech tech firm that they, they employ about 400 people um you know they're not Facebook they're not a Google they're, they're not Right. Not a Netflix who you know are are you know a well well known brand, but they're still got you know even on this meetup, like you say, it's in Orange County, it's in Irvine. Um, they've got four hundred and seventy members mm -hmm. within within that meetup group. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's a, and and they, they look like they've got a, an event. If anyone's in that area, them who's a, a GraphQL um, specialist, uh, I don't think we'll have any of them on the call. But there's an event on Tuesday. You know where they've got um, a, a guest speaker, um, a guy called Trevor. Trevor, he's talking about strategies. For doing that and there's 35 people there mm -hmm. you know now to make that if we think about numbers if i i'm always thinking about objectives i'm always thinking about angles how many people do you need to hire out of that 35 on a regular basis to make that work for you well do you know what that 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 event is happening at the office for 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 weed maps so it's going to cost very little mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. you're getting candidates into the environment that prospective candidates right. have been become familiar with the brand um you know if you place one person every couple of months from that event that that event's valuable because these are guys who are probably on what the best part of one hundred and fifty thousand oh, yeah. dollars. Uh, you know they're they're, yep. they're they're good people. Uh, a typical staffing fee um, for that is what thirty percent, mm -hmm. even. You know, so you place one of those people every couple of weeks, uh, every couple of months. Um, it might even be less. Then then it's fantastic. That takes a couple of hours of planning. Um, it takes a couple of hours to actually <clears throat> run the event. Um, for me, for me, that's brilliant. There's another great example um, of, of events. One of our, our clients is a company called SiteMinder, and their big challenge um, I actually forgot to load their <clears throat> load their screen up, um, but I can show you um, SiteMinder. Oh, if I could actually type 
Um, there we go. Um, Spike Minds are a business to business brand um, who are based in, in Sydney, but they do have offices in, in, um, in Austin um, and offices in Galway and, and Ireland as well. Their challenge is, is that people don't know who they are. It's not that they've, they've got a controversial brand. It's like, you know, the, the, the um, the exact same example that you were you were talking about with Teradata, you know, people just simply don't really know who they are, despite the fact that they're well established, um, mm -hmm. despite the fact that they they um, they are, you know, they employ. I think they now employ about eight hundred people, um, and and they do the same thing in Sydney. You know, so they are working in particular. They're doing some really clever stuff on AWS um, um, related to microservices, and they the all the meetups that they have um, are around that. Um, so that's their way of going, do you know what? Nobody who knows who they are, but let's focus on the technology. Let's talk about, about that. Um, and you know, we, we will absolutely get people um, get people talking about our organization and actually becoming familiar with, with who we are um, and, uh, and what we do. Um, now, I, um, so that's events. Um, is there any other examples of companies, um, Mark? I'm, I'm actually um, just throwing, throwing this question at you. Anyone else off the top of your head who have been running really good events that have helped to get over a brand challenge that, that you can think of just before I move on? Um, you know, one that comes to mind and, uh, is um, the Clorox company, which of course people are familiar with Clorox bleach, but Clorox is actually a leader in over 60 consumer uh, product categories, including automotive products. They do armor all, um, they do fresh step kitty litter, they do hidden Valley ranch dressing. So they're a very diversified company. Um, and they use events to help their diversity and inclusion efforts. And what they do is they, uh, reach out to, uh, resource groups for, uh, minorities and women here in the United States, like the society of Hispanic MBAs, um, uh, organizations like that, and they will offer to host that uh, organization's meeting at a choice venue in San Francisco. It's usually the Museum of the African Dis Diaspora, which is a very, um, it's a great venue for uh, events, and it's also fascinating to walk through the exhibits. And it's, you know, very well catered and so forth. And what they do is they'll say to the organization, you know, if your members bring someone who's qualified to join, who isn't currently a member, and they sign up that evening, we will pay that person's first year's dues. And um, so the organizations get really excited. They go out and they, you know, get all their members to bring in potential members. Clorox shows up and, you know, we used to uh, arrange these events for them and you have the big check with the, you know, $12,000 or whatever it is. Um, but the idea is, is you're building, again, that relationship um, and, and not to totally disparage, but a lot of employers will simply take an ad in a newsletter or a magazine. And really, what kind of results can you expect from that? Whereas Clorox is actually meeting with the people and getting to know them and allowing them to get to know Clorox. And um, the result is, you know, it's very effective at building those relationships with specific communities that they want to recruit from. Yep, yeah, and it's not a brand I'm aware of. They're, they're very kind of U US centric, um, mm. you know. But but um, yeah, guys, that's the brand. If you're if you're outside the US and you're not familiar with them, then um, take a look and, and take a look at, at what they do. Um, you know, it's, it's genuinely taking um, something that's incredibly boring um, mm. and and trying to take it into you know turn it into something something a bit more um, a bit more real life and um, and obviously impactful as well due to the due to the subject and, and what right. we're talking about. I also love the fact they're spawns, uh, that they're tied in with Toy Story Four uh, <laughs> as well. So 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 there, there we go. Um, absolutely absolutely outstanding. Um, great. So a um, couple of other non. Um, uh, we're going to talk about some other examples. Now, guys, the, the good thing is about these things, the events things that we're, we've spoken about there, they are, like I said, these, you know, you pick 
pick a couple of technology if we use the technology example pick a couple of developers who love talking about what they, they they talk about if you're in other environments who do you know that likes talking talking about what they do you know it actually doesn't matter we're using technology as examples here um and i'm going to talk about some other examples but it doesn't matter what the division is um and what what the specialism is it's fairly easy to actually get people involved um in this it can be really informal it can be really cheap and it can be really quick to to set up but what you're not doing doing in any of these examples is to, event examples is you're not talking about jobs directly right. and that's where it's authentic um isn't it mark you know that that's this is where you know you get over that hurdle um um and and actually mark you give me an example of when you first and i don't want to criticize any employer and particularly you know teradata is a great organization but you you told me a, a little story about when you first first joined teradata about something that the recruiter uh, i think one of the recruiters said to you when you were talking about um to, or talking to them about what their challenges were yes um so you know uh it, and this is not uh, certainly unique to teradata it's a very common uh issue and um uh, I was being introduced to the recruiter corps as the new head of recruitment marketing. And one of the recruiters asked me why nobody was responding to their in-mails. And I had to laugh because it's an open secret in Silicon Valley that no developer, no technical person really um, even looks at in-mails, or if they do, it's very rare because they're inundated with them. Um, and you know, the reality is they, they just become inured to that form of communication. And this is not to put a slam on LinkedIn. There are a lot of good things about it. But, you know, the effectiveness of that particular channel is unfortunately impacted by the fact that it's overused. And worse, I think a lot of the queries that go out are completely unqualified, which again speaks to the fact that the recruiter hasn't even taken the most elementary steps to building a relationship. They clearly don't have any understanding of who the person is they're reaching out to or what might be of concern or, or might appeal to that person. They're just putting it out there. It really does amount to spam. And that's unfortunate. Yeah, and, and that's how, you know, by taking by taking the approach like Weed Maps is taking with with those events, um, you're you're probably the one out of a hundred recruiters who are doing something different. Um, if you are are trying to you know add value to what that person is doing and by introducing them to a specialist, then you're 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 absolutely making making uh, making a, uh, taking a different approach. Um, well, now I, I'm going to I'm going to highlight. Um, we like to talk about what our clients do. Actually, I'm here at Candid ID. Um, one of our favorite um, clients. In fact, all my all my clients are like are my favorite clients. I can't, uh, they're, they're, you better say allowed, that. They're, yeah, they're, they're they're like children. I'm not allowed to to say yeah. uh, or or cats in my case. You're not allowed to say which ones are your are your favorite, are you? Um, but um, spec savers um, who. Um, Anyone who follows Candidate ID will know we work very closely with them, both in the UK um, and in Europe. Um, Specsavers um, in Europe have got um, their um, the, their networking um, site called Green Club, um, and in the UK um, they've got a very similar thing and it's called Spectrum. Um, now, um, this is um, a slightly bigger, you know, uh, the weed, weed map stuff that we're talking about is quite small. You can get things up and running really, really quickly. Um, when you then start to um, look at networking community sites, it takes a little bit more time and a little bit more investment to do, but but it's significant dividends. So um, Green Club, um, it's a, a members only website. It's for um, both spec savers and employees and um, external employees. Um, so other um, other people that work in the optical industry. Um, just to let you know a little stat about, about certainly about the UK, um, industry for, for optometrists. Um, there are only about 13,000 um, optometrists um, in the UK and it's at full employment. 37% um, um, of optometrists in the United Kingdom are already employed by Specsavers. <laughs> okay. um, so this, this just shows you actually how competitive a marketplace that it is. So Specsavers had to do something different um, to, to try and engage in Engage with the optometry market. So what they've got is their community of uh, community networks, and um, they've got the website, 
on the website, they've got lots and lots of technical content. content okay, so they've got optometry quiz, uh, uh, quizzes. They've got um, information um, that, that's relevant to optometrists and ophthalmologists and audiologists. Um, so um, things about um, extropia, um, about heterophoria. Um, these are easy words if you can pronounce them. Um, <laughs> but as you can see, this is really, really technical content. And people who are members of this community earn professional points. For, for reading these blogs and learning about them. The, can, the prospective candidates can log in um, to the site and track all of their activity. Exactly the same with the UK equivalent spectrum. Um, you know, they're talking about preventable site loss and they're talking about glaucoma and um, they're talking about how the organisation works with the health service in the in, in the UK as well. So now, now they're a little bit different, you know, from meetups in that they, they do talk about recruitment in some way. So you can see here there's a link to the, the Specsavers recruitment team on the UK page. On the European page, there is a link to their career site as well, but none of the posts and none of the content that's being pushed out um, onto that site is about vacancies. Okay, so okay. they don't sell jobs, they don't do anything like that. It's all professional education, but also they've got lots of events as well. So um, the certainly the Europe team they run about I think if I remember rightly it's about eight or nine events um, every year um, across across Northern Europe where they they get you know anywhere between fifty and four hundred. Um, optometrists in one place uh, and run you know full day events or, or evening events um, for them as well um, we, we support spec savers in this they, they use our um, candidate ID software um, for the engagement piece um, so we engage with candidates by email by text messaging by landing pages um, we they use our software to to power them as well that's attached to this. So any any of the events that are listed, um, any of the registration pages are powered, uh, powered by candidate ID as well, which means they can automatically send out event-related communication to the prospective candidates as well. Now, Specsavers in Europe, in Northern Europe, on, on Green Club, over the past 14 months, they've engaged with 100% um, of their registered members. Okay, using candidate ID and using their their Green Club website, that, that's it's unbelievable, and it was even a statistic that surprised me. So by taking an approach of having really high quality and relevant content alongside the correct delivery mechanism, you know, making sure that you get into people's inboxes, making sure that text messages are used for people that perhaps don't engage, um, engage with with content, uh, sort of engage with email content sent over email then you can achieve really, really high engagement rates. And what this does is it gives their team of recruiters across uh, across Europe um, a pool of people who know that the brand is more than just jobs, okay? It's right. a, that they are technical specialists, um, that, they, um, that they attract um, the speak as well uh, as a, an understanding that if they, they join the organization, um, if they do eventually choose to do that, then there's going to be a focus on learning and development and continuous professional <coughs> development as well. So um, for me, it's just a spectacular example um, of, of what works um, with that industry as well. I would um, agree. And I, I think it's uh, I think the reason it's so successful is that Specsavers is offering something of value to its audience. And that's really what it's all about. You know, a, a lot of times people will make a half-hearted attempt at CRM and they'll push out, let's say, corporate PR. And not that there's anything wrong with that, but you can tell from the get-go it's self-serving. You know, think about what they're doing is they're offering information, they're offering learning. And so if I'm an optometrist or an ophthalmologist in the UK or in Northern Europe, I want to be a part of this community because I'm going to learn something that's going to help me be better in my career. And you know, it just takes sitting down and thinking through what could we offer the target audiences we're trying to attract, you know, whether it's engineers or consultants or salespeople or what have you, you know, what are they looking for? And then giving it to them. And, and to your point, Billy, you don't necessarily have to create it out of nothing. There's probably a lot of good content sitting around in your marketing group, uh, in the daily activities of your organization. And I think one of the problems is we become so inured to what's going on internally, 
with our organization, we don't see that it potentially could be very special to someone on the outside. Uh, you know, uh, even, you know, we talked about the, the video from Monzo, uh, the guy shows a day of the life and it's, eh, you know, but there's something very captivating about it. That this is a that takes me nicely on to talking about Monzo. So for those that don't know Monzo, um, they're a, a bank um, in the UK. Um, they're what we call a challenger bank. Um, so they're very very different from the traditional banks such as HSBC and Barclays. Um, and they're a perfect example of <clears throat> an organisation which has taken its consumer following and who have managed to turn it into um, one one of the best examples of employer brand that I've actually seen. Um, they, they've got a dedicated community forum but the community forum is just all about the product and it doesn't talk about recruitment but they do hire from the community forum they take people you see when you look through I, I'm a Monzo customer I don't know if anyone else on the call is um, but you know when I look through the community and you see new members of staff joining um, they, they all say oh well I'm a Monzo customer um, um, who was part of the community and now uh, I'm an em an employee, so you know it's not just the fact that you know they're 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 a Monzo card holder um, that they've used the banking service. It's the fact that they've then felt as a customer that they're part of a community, and you can see the engagement on this is is crazy. There's stuff happening uh, every single day um, on on Monzo. Um, it's absolutely spectacular um, and definitely one that you should all be looking at. But as Mark, as I said, um, you know that converts nicely into recruiter brand uh, into employee lawyer Brett, as mark says you know it's um you know that that's something that you can't you just simply can't make artificially you just can't it's it's a genuine thing and he was mark was talking about the video that that um uh, a chap i follow on on twitter um um stevie buckley shared um actually made me aware of a couple of couple of days ago um so so hat tip to stevie for sharing that and i know he's a big big fan of Monzo as well. Um, this is a week in the life of a Monzo developer, part one. It was published by this person, Jake Wright. So it's not even on the Monzo channel. Okay. It was published on the 14th of June um, and it's got 93,575 views <laughs> in, in six days. And in fact, since uh, I shared it with Mark yesterday, um, it's had another eight, eight, eight and a half thousand views. Do you know? And when you ask, it's now we we are so I think in, in our world um of, of social media of Facebook of LinkedIn of Twitter of Instagram and all that you know we're so oh likes are everything you know if if you've got a high amount of likes on a video that that's brilliant well you know know what this has got great views it's got great likes but take a look at the quality of the engagement on the comments as well you know people saying it's the best life uh video that I've ever seen. Um, they're talking about some of the tools that they're using internally, so Notion, a, a note-taking software. Um, it even comes down to them talking about um, the type of um, soda, um, um, as we call it in Scotland. The, 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 um, they've got San Pellegrino, um, you know, um, talking. Um, you know, this is just, this is engagement at, at, at another level. This, this is um, absolutely, absolutely phenomenal. Um, as Mark says, it's, do you know what? It's a nice video. It's not dramatic of anything, but it's actually it's authentic. It's Jake, Jake has taken the time to do it. Um, yep. So, so it's a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant piece piece of software. And 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 Mark, for you, you didn't know Monzo until we spoke about this. Um, right. what, what's your thoughts thoughts on on Monzo and how they've managed to convert their consumer brand into into that employer brand? Well, as you said, they're a challenger brand, so they have to. Uh, make very clear the case as to why I should, you know, choose to take up with a an upstart, basically, as opposed to an established bank. And most people prefer banks that have been around a while because they know they're stable. They're going to, you know, be a safe place to uh, deposit their money or borrow from. And Monzo has turned a lot of their customers into fans. And I don't know of very many banks, at least here in the United States, where the customers are fans. Here we kind of put up with them, <laughs> and um, you know Monzo has done that. And then in the case of this uh, developer, you know he has created this video that um, if you look at, and I'm not going to pick on anybody, but you know if you look at say Bank of America, and which is a much very well known brand in the United States, it's global, it has a huge footprint, and none of their videos 
uh, even come close to the viewership that this has had. And um, in fact, the only one uh, that relates to the bank, uh, Bank of America, that has uh, huge viewership is someone complaining about how they were fired. Um, <laughs> with, uh, you know, you know that, that says something right there. Um, and I, I noticed real quickly, we had a question about Glassdoor and- Yes, I was gonna come whole, to that from that, yeah. Yeah, we could, we could do a whole webinar about that. But to answer the question is number one, uh, not every review on Glassdoor is negative. Um, and, and in fact, if you look at the ratio of positive to negative reviews on your Glassdoor profile, that tells you a lot about how you're perceived in the marketplace. And uh, a lot of employers like to dismiss it as simply a place where people like to grouse about their employers. But the reality is people who are genuinely happy and enthusiastic go on there as well. And the key is, number one, to show everybody that you do follow the reviews. And the way you show that is by responding to all the reviews. And, you know, particularly in the case of bad reviews, uh, you don't want to let that sit out there and fester. You have to come back and you have to state your case. And in some cases, they may have you dead to rights. You know, what they're complaining about is something that is a problem. And in a case like that, you simply say, we are aware of this. We are taking steps to correct it. We thank you for bringing it to our attention and we will, you know, make it right in, in the uh, time to come. Um, the other thing real quickly is um, one way to foster good reviews is to remind people at certain inflection points in their career that it would be a nice thing to let people know uh, how you feel about working at our company. So think about it. When somebody hits like their six month anniversary, they're still kind of in the honeymoon phase. Um, you know, send them a little email. Hey, thank you for six months of great service. We hope you're enjoying working with us as much as we enjoy having you on our team. And if you care to, why don't you, um, uh, you know, post a review about us on Glassdoor. Never, ever, ever tell them to post a positive review because that'll get you in deep trouble. But just simply say, hey, why don't you post a review? Um, another inflection point is uh, with your salespeople, if they have an annual kickoff event, um, they're going to be all jazz because they've spent a week in some resort town uh, getting all pumped up about the product and about the company. Give it about a month and then say to them, hey, you know, hope you enjoyed sales kickoff. I hope your year is going to be successful. And if you got a minute, why don't you let people know what it's like to work here? and you will get, and, and companies like Dell have actually measured this, you will get a measurable uptick in positive reviews and your ratings if you do that. And Fantastic. again, that goes to the whole thing about relationships. Yeah, that, that, that that's great advice. I, th I think um, the, the, the point in particular, just about making people aware about you know, uh, about Glassdoor and other review sites, you know, just, you know, just, just, you know, signposting them as opposed to requesting, um, you know, we, we, we've done similar, I've done similar things in the past with, with Facebook um, reviews, for example, and, and, it, and it kind of, it works really well. I think the, the, the other thing for me as well on that is overcoming, you know, Glassdoor reviews are, are only part of the picture. What you want to try and do is make sure that there's enough content out there that gives a balanced view um, as well. So, Glassdoor is never a prospective candidate's only only view right. of your your organization. So make sure that there's enough content out there that gives a balanced view. There are always going to be candidates who are unhappy, okay, right. with with working. Um there there's always going to be candidates um who you know have got you know who moan. There's always going to be false reviews um right. as well. Um you know it's it, so it's about going, okay, someone goes on to Glassdoor, then someone goes on to Indeed. If they Google your organization, what else is going to come up that, that's relevant? You know, is it going to support the theory that you're a, you know, a bad employer? Or is it going to um, actually allow your organization to show, look, there, here's one side of it, here, here's the other side of it. So some, fo some form of content on sites, whether it's your own career site, your own main site, um, whether it's on social channels, gives something that gives a, gives a view, a, a balanced view. Um, 
Jennifer's made a point. Um, we, thanks, Jennifer, for contributing. We started at 2.8 um, on Glassdoor at the end of last year, invested in reaching out to current employees that love it here to leave reviews. And now we're at four and a half. Fantastic, Jennifer. So, um, you know, spot on, you know, by, by cultivating that. And it's not a, a you know, don't expect it to be a fix within two weeks. You know, you want it right. to be be longer. You know, it's going to be a slow burn. It might take six months for 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 you to get there. But like Jennifer um, has proven, um, you you can absolutely absolutely do it. Jennifer, if if you feel comfortable sharing the 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 link to your company's Glassdoor profile, then it would be great to see it. Um, it's it's your call of choice, of course. Um, just just to finish off, um, just conscious of time, please get your additional questions and just before we wrap up. Um, I just wanted to share one other example. We've got quite a few people on the call who are from a, a staffing or an agency background. So I just wanted to show something that I really like and that's something that's a big different, uh, a bit different, but it is a significant investment. Okay, so it's, we've went from, you know, ideas that are on the lower end of the scale, some to, to, to the middle of the scale, and now we're, we're right up to stuff that's probably a little bit more expensive. We're talking about Salesforce. Uh, sorry, Computer Futures, um, uh, a technology staffing business um, who um, across across the world, they've invested significantly in Salesforce um, as their their target market. They are Salesforce specialists, and actually their community, their Salesforce community, um, they began building that, uh, and they've hired a, a Salesforce evangelist, a Salesforce practitioner, someone who's never really been involved in the recruitment market before, um, who was a former um, Salesforce administrator, Salesforce developer, um, and is now well known within the U.S. market in particular, within within California for for um, you know um, starting up some some fantastic some some uh, some fa so, excuse me some fantastic salesforce events so um this is a bigger investment but actually an evangelist someone who's already well known within the marketplace that adds you know a th a th authenticity to what you're trying to do um so if if you are hiding if you work in you know, if you work in commercial um, and you hire someone who has got a great reputation for being an established salesperson, someone who's been networking, someone who is out in the market and is talking to, to other people, then um, that, that can be a great way um, of just getting over any scepticism. I love the phrase sceptical candidates because I think prospective candidates are normally really sceptical until until you, you prove to them that actually some something else is, is happening. So um, I, I love that example example it's something it's a bit more expensive um to do but i know um that they are a client of ours i know after talking to them that it is working and they're, they're getting some fantastic results um as a as a result of that um bobby um bobby's made a comment and um, thanks very much for contributing bobby we have a great culture most people are happy here i've asked for glass door reviews multiple times and staff meetings a recent email push pointed out to new hires and ask leaving employees and exit interviews to no avail um mark um have you got any advice um there um for for bobby um you know any advice to help them to try and get get more reviews on Glassdoor or, or any other sites? Well, I think, you know, uh, the old saying is silence is deafening. And um, I think the feedback you're getting is that people uh, are really not inclined to post reviews. And what that suggests is they don't want to say negative things about the organization. Um, one of the tools I like to use in situations like that is what I call interventional focus groups. And... Uh, you just uh, want to gather a cross section of people. Um, you know, ideally, you should have a third party conduct them so people feel free to speak openly and candidly about the organization and really get to the core of, OK, why are people reluctant to leave a review? Because I think most people, you know, the example we just talked about with Jake, um, you know, uh, you know, posting that video, um, it, it appeared to me anyway, I don't know if this is the case, but it appeared Jake did that on his own volition. So Jake is obviously stoked about working at Monzo and he wanted to share with people what it's like for him and what a day in the life is like. Um, you know, if Jake wasn't happy or didn't like the company, he wouldn't have done it. Uh, so I think the fact that uh, people who, uh, you know, are reluctant to post you need to dig a little deeper and find out why that is. Brilliant. Um, and Jennifer's um, just added some some advice as well. Um, thanks, Jennifer. We, 
we did something internally through our company across Canada and gave them a candy bar as a way of persuading them uh, in a fun way. Everyone loved it. We saw so many more reviews come in and buy something so small. You know, great, great idea is, is something that, that raises awareness of right. what, what you're trying to do. You're you're just simply suggesting, look, this is an initiative across the organization. Again, it's no pressure right. on individuals right. to actually do it. You're not monitoring whether individuals, you know, actually do do um, leave, leave a review um, or, or not. But you're, you know, it's a, it's a great awareness um, scheme. And, um, and it's a great relationship builder. You know, it's, uh, it's a small, thoughtful gesture that people are like, oh, wow, that's really cool. Uh, you know, it's, um, uh, you know, it's little things like that that add up to a great relationship. Um, you know, you don't want to bribe people and say, oh, you know, uh, you'll, you'll get something really grandiose if you post a positive review. It just tell people what you think. Because the other thing, and, and again, this could be a whole nother webinar, is Glassdoor is really a good way to keep pulse on what people are talking about in terms of your company. And anybody who works with Glassdoor data knows you can identify it by location, by discipline. You can slice and dice that data a million different ways. And it can really point you to problem areas within your organization. So a lot of employers I know don't like Glassdoor, but you know, as hoteliers and restaurateurs have found out about Yelp, it's a fact of life. So you may as well embrace it and use it as a tool and you'll be much better off. Fantastic. Um, just to answer uh, last question from Mike there, um, yes, uh, the webinar will be sent out to everyone who's attended and everyone who's not been able to come along um, by email as well. It will also be posted onto our YouTube channel, um, our Facebook channel, um, probably onto the side of the office door and everywhere else where we can put, put a link um, as well. So yes, absolutely, um, it will be available. Um, Listen, I, I really appreciate you taking time out your busy day, um, Mark. Um, it's um, I've always um, our, our conversations, and we've been fortunate enough to meet a few times in, in the past. And um, you're, it's always insightful. Today um, is no different. Um, there's been some fantastic advice there. Uh, I hope we've given people some great examples of what you can do to get over the sceptical candidates to avoid um, um, candidates criticizing what, what, what you're trying to do um, and to give an honest um, um, honest view to, um, of what your company is really like to work for. Um, we uh, the, the webinar recording will come out by email. Do let us know if you've got any comments, feedback, just, just drop us a note. Please connect with me on LinkedIn, Billy McDermott, M-C-D-I-A-R-M-I-D and Mark Hornung, um, Mark, H-O-R-N-U-N-G, and we'll be happy to answer any questions you've got. Mark, any closing remarks uh, before before we finish up for the day? Oh, I just uh, encourage everybody to really look within their organizations and see how they can build those relationships and build the communities like you've shown with, um, you know, computer futures or with spec savers, and um, good luck to everyone. Brilliant. Well, listen, thanks again. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day or your evening. I'm um, away to the pub. See you later. Okay. Have a good one. Take care. Cheers, bye. Bye-bye.